Psalms chapter 127, a song of degrees for Solomon. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Um, every foundation's got to be of God. Everything, the first commandment is God first. You got people that are building houses and they're going to be destroyed. This world is going to be destroyed. Man and his works are vain. And there are people in religion that are building houses, churches and all that, and it, the, the labor is vain. People are donating money to build their church and all that, and God is not in it. It's vain. And they're going to get before the, the judge, probably, maybe, assumption, the great white throne judgment, and realize it's not. It's nothing. Not. Vain. You get no credit. Or even if you are saved and you're involved in a religion, and, you, you, you know, I built this church. It's not going to be credited to you. I remember my grandpa, when we drive around certain areas and like that, he'd, be, he'd point to a church and say, I built that church. I built that church. And none of that credit is going to go to him because, first of all, he wasn't. Well, as far as my grandpa got saved, we, we don't know. He got, he got saved earlier than he got physically strength saved. But to build houses of, you know, we're talking about Solomon, we're talking about the temple. And there are people out there, you know, they look, you know, didn't we build this? There are Baptist churches out there. Didn't I put money to that magic thermometer so we could build it? And was, was God involved in it? I have been in so many churches where you had the thermometer building program, and then after that, watched the church fail. I'm not going to give the names, but you can count them on one hand. It's something right after that building program that something came into that church and just. And when you read in the book of Acts, the, the apostles would go house to house to house. There was never in this age of church age that we are. It is not about big buildings. I would safely assume to say that a church, a group of people, should be on every street, if not every block, within walking distance. In a 22-mile radius that we are living right now, and they only find one good Bible-believing church, is pitiful. Because in that 22-mile radius, there are churches by the galore. It fills the yellow pages. And there's nothing more sickening today is to read some of these church signs in front of their buildings, what they put on them. And most of them are not built by the Lord. Solomon, or this, this psalm dedicated to Solomon, says, Unless the Lord build that temple, Solomon... Don't you give yourself the credit. Except the Lord keep the city. We've been Jerusalem. The watchman waketh but in vain. The watchman gets up in vain to, to, to stand his post if God is not in it. Because if God's not in it, the enemy will come and take over the city. I don't care if you have a watchman every square inch on the wall. Because the walls of Babylon were not were not kept by God, and that city was destroyed in one night. And God warned Belshazzar. Belshazzar did not heed to God, and the city was destroyed by the most unlikeliest way. They left the, the gates of the river open. So they drained the river and went in. It is vain for you to rise up early and to sit up late. Uh, 
Who is the you? And even I've taken this verse to say, hey, you know, even my job, is, you know, I rise up early, I sit up late to go to work, third shift, and, you know. But the you is to the builders and to the watchmen, verse 1. To eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Man needs rest. And there are some people, you know, they'll go to bed at 12 o'clock at midnight and wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning. And you know what? You're not going to survive and you're not going to be healthy. You're, that lack of sleep is just as worse as getting too much sleep. Everything in man's life on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being the complete lowest and 10 being a complete high, you've got to be a 5. Your sleep has to be a 5. Don't be a 4, too much sleep, and don't be a, five, a 6, too little sleep. And it would be vain for you... To get lack of sleep, eat the bread of sorrow. And you run to Genesis 3.17 and verse 19 where God said, listen, the curse is that you're going from sorrow, from sweat, you're going to till the bread. There's only so many hours in a day to do your job. If you want to, if you want to prove verse 2 to all men. You may have abundance, but what is time? You don't know what time is. You don't know how much time you have. Solomon dies, leaves everything to his son Rehoboam, and Rehoboam, we don't even know, but I mean, within a chapter, the entire nation is split into two in a civil war that lasts all through the, all through the Bible. We go into another subject. Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord. Children are not a curse. They are not burdensome, as Americans think today. A child, or giving birth to a child to a woman today would be, oh, that's going to ruin my career, or that's going to ruin my party life, that's going to ruin the fun. And the fact is that we legalize abortion. Now, is abortion murder? Well, let's look at verse 3. Lo, children are inherited to the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. They are a heritage and they are a reward from God. For some people, they are a reward from the welfare system. The more I get, the more money I get from the state. Now, if that verse is applied to all people, not just Jews. You got to realize something, mother. You got to realize something, father. I say father last because there are children today who don't even know who their father is. And they can probably pick any man in the street where their mother is. And you have better odds of choosing your father that way. If all children are a heritage of God and a reward from the womb, the fruit of the womb, that's a baby, God is going to hold you accountable for those children. That is why when, I, when I'm on the street and I'll preach and I see somebody with children, I will say uh, that the Bible says that Jesus says, Suffer the little children to come unto me. It is your job, mother and father. I don't care if they're lost. I don't care what they are. It is their job to bring their children to Jesus Christ. It's not the job of vacation Bible school. 
It is not the job of a church to drive around in a bus to pick up your child. It is your responsibility. What if Christianity tomorrow in this country on August 5th, 2014, what if it becomes illegal? And locks are put on church doors. And the Christians who want to do right have to go underground. And you can't reach as many people. Mama, Papa, what about your child? I won't be able to, if, if it became illegal to serve God, I wouldn't be able to reach as many people as I reach today. Unless I want to go to jail and, and, and then trust God. Isaiah 13, 18, Hosea 9, 16, Luke 1, 42, Genesis 30, verse 2, and Deuteronomy 7, 13. On this verse. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man for battle, his weapon, his desire, his goods, what is needed, so are children of the youth. An offensive item used for war. That children are to protect their parents. And as a man in battle, look at my arrow. Listen, they shined those arrows. They just didn't throw their arrows. They shined them. They kept them clean. They kept them sharp. It takes work for children. But not in America. We just throw them off to the public school system. You know the public school system? I am sorry. I don't care what you say. is a violation of scripture. Because God gave you the children. Not teachers. Not the government. But if man wasn't so in the love of money. That oh I want more money. And I've got to work 14 jobs. To pay for stuff I don't need, and then you know, oh, I gotta charge outrageous rents, and I gotta charge outrageous electricity bill, and all that, and I gotta charge outrageous gas, and then I gotta charge outrageous and make outrageous fees, and I gotta have more money so I can buy the more junk I don't need, and we're throwing the children off. Children in America have become a burdensome thing. And when you read about the fatherless and the widows, there was a time in America and there are times in the Middle East countries and there's a time in the Bible that when, when dad died, I don't care if your son was 7, 10 years old, 25 years old, he will have to step in there and take over dad and help his mom and his children. That used to happen in America. But laws of the nation that you can't make these children work, but you send them to school so they become lazy. What do you mean by being lazy? Tell me what job out, out there, by being trained by school, you get three months off for a summer vacation. Tell me. Tell me what job out there where the employer comes out and picks you up and brings you to the, employer, to the place of work and then will bring you home. Tell me. Happy is the man that has a quiver full of them. Children. He's ready. He's prepared. There are joy. There are blessing. They shall not be ashamed. Well, there are plenty of fathers and mothers today that are ashamed. 
There are Bible believing churches out there who will look at the people's children. Not here. Prisons are full of children. Someone's child is in prison. Adolf Hitler had a mother and a father one day. A woman that gives birth the fruit of the womb. And even if it's a stillbirth, she will give birth to somebody that will populate heaven or hell. So why would the Bible say shall not be ashamed? What unsaved man would read the Bible and study the Bible? You want to stop everybody that we meet downtown. Stop everybody and ask them. Name at least one chapter of the Bible you read today. How many chapters do you think you're going to be on right now? How about ask them a very simple question. Can you give me one chapter in the Bible where it explains God creating the universe? You think you're going to get the answer? You're going to get an answer, my jury of three quarters of people who say, well, I don't believe that God created the universe. So when we sit here as a family, and when you listen to this video or you listen to this audio, you want to learn something from God, and you are trying to raise your children right, and then you're not going to be ashamed. In Romans chapter 10, around verses 11, 12, it says, If you believe on the Lord, you shall not be ashamed. Well, let's say by chance you are a Christian, you love the Lord, and you do right, and you raise a child that is just, he's going to die and go to hell. How are you not going to be ashamed at that? If you did everything you try, that God in the Word has told you to do, it's not to your shame. You think if you did everything to the best of your ability that God has shown you in the, in, the, in the Bible as a father and as a mother and as parents together. I mean, there's a father's job to raise a child and there's a mother's job to raise a child. And then there's both of them to raise their child. And that child dies and goes off to hell. You think that God is not going to be so cruel and, and say, well, I'm just going to because he went to hell, you failed. No. Matter of fact, it would be more to his troubles and his problems at the great white throne judgment that you tried your best and you prayed and you tried to bring that. That's not happening today. And I'm not talking about that's not how ha, that's not happening in I'm gonna say Baptist churches. I'm gonna hate Baptist as a name now with the churches there. There are people in a Baptist church that proclaim to love the Bible and love God and be saved, and they are not raising their children. They want the pastor, they want the Sunday school teacher to give them all the Bible that they for a whole entire life or what? If you go just Sunday morning, uh, an hour and a half all week. A maximum of three hours entire week is the pastor and the Sunday school teacher is supposed to teach your children. Meanwhile, you let them have the TV, you let them have video games, you let them have everything else besides God, then you will be ashamed. But if you are a proper parent and love the Lord and want to do right, and you got to balance your time, you got to sacrifice things, you got to sacrifice the uh, enjoyment to raise your children, try to raise them up in the Lord, and you know, you sit down with them with a the Bible, you have family Bible, you make sure they learn, memorize scripture, you make sure that one of their courses is about the Bible when you homeschool them. There's no shame.
So the shame here is is in numbers. Now the Oriental people number. You know why did David marry a lot of women? Because it was an access. It was no, not an access. It was a. It was a status to have children. And as many as children you could have, that, that meant something. Especially male children. But for David, not a, a lot of them made him ashamed. For someone who loved the Lord and did right, he didn't raise those children right. You know what you got to do when you have children? And some of you are going to disagree with me, but I don't care. And I failed in this. You got to give your children 100% of your effort and time. And no parent can. But you can't hand them over to the government that doesn't believe in God. I'm going to say this. I agree. People right here in my family will agree with me. You can't handle. You can't hand. You can't hand over your children to a church that has fun and games and playtime, and expect them to come out godly. Why ain't we having this national revival and children are being saved five years old and being called to preach at seven and going out there an old day? Because you have handled your children over to the world and junk and garbage and not yourself. Mama would take little girls and grandma would take little girls and teach them how to cook, how to take care of a baby. Instead of having a baby, she would learn how to take care of a baby, how to sew and fix clothes, because you didn't have no Walmarts back then. You didn't buy. That means mama would have to take her little girls out there and say, this is how you shear a sheep, and this is how you take the sheep to make wool. And dad would grab the boys, the sons, and say, come on, we're going out in the fields, and this is how you, you want, you want a sandwich? You want to say it? Okay. You got to grow your own tomatoes. You got to grow your own lettuce. You got to work the ground. How do you know Adam was a good father? Because Cain knew how to grow fruit and, and Abel knew how to slaughter animals. How about that? Did you know that? Those fruits that didn't come out of the ground for Cain one day. Oh, just, just start picking. He shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. What's that? All I can think of is the Hatfield McCormick's. You don't mess with that boy. You don't mess with that man over there. That that man has twelve sons. You mess with that man that over there. You you got twelve sons that are gonna come after you with rifles. And if you do mess with them, and you and you got this family, you're gonna have a battle that's gonna go back and forth, and it's gonna go from generation to generation to defend their old man. A child was to be your defense. And then when he grew up and he learned to be a man from his father, when he married a woman, he would be a man to, to his wife. 
There was no sissies. There was no rebellious children. Listen, rebellious children, according to the law, if you were a Jew, were to be stoned. So except the Lord build the house, they that labor in vain build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are inheritance of the Lord, the fruit of his womb is, is his reward. There's no paragraph marking. As arrows are in the hand of the mighty men, so is the children of his youth. Happy is the man that has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. What is the heritage of the Lord? What is the, the, the not being ashamed? Is when you build your house upon the Lord, verse 1. Before you say I do and take that woman off to the wedding bed and you, you go to the father and say I want to take your daughter to be my wife and all that and he gives you permission from that day set and you say that man and that woman get down their knees and they pray daily for God for their marriage and after they're married and they're involved in the marriage bed and they know what the marriage bed can produce. Then they say, Lord, if you give us children, if you bless us with the children, we need your help. The foundation before it's even started. We need you, God, to help us. We need to realize that raising a child is expensive, Lord, but we're going to raise it for you. We need you to support our house, to pay our bills, that mama stays home. I go to work. I need you for, for mama to take care of the house. I, you need me, Lord, to go out there and get the money. And we need not to spend more. And we need to spend and raise time with those children. We need the foundation of God. And with the foundation of God, we won't have the worldliness. What did, what did our great-grandparents do before there was Xboxes and movies and television? What did they do for entertainment? I remember as a little boy, there was a television, but we go out on, on summer nights and uh, my parents would sit out on a, on a chair on the porch with some people and it would be a bunch of kids. We have a jar. We go around catching all the lightning bugs we catch and make them extinct. Or we blow bubbles all, you know, make the whole neighborhood fill with bubbles. We didn't need television. Use imagination. My dad was able to, to, to bring me home every once in a while a pile of dirt from work. All those kids would be there with matchbox cars and all that. Today it's all done on the computer. And there was a family organization. As mom and dad took care of grandma and grandpa, grandma and grandpa took care of the children too, and they never usurped the authority of mom or dad. When they served authority and did things for the kids that, that violated God. I mean, that's the Waltons. When, they, when the parents and the grandparents loved the children to do right. And there were no rewards. You did what you're supposed to do. That's it. And if you didn't do what you're supposed to do, you got a licking. <laughs> then you you know you, you don't get no sleep. You, you improper times. That ain't gonna do you any good. This I know I. For a thing, third shift work, it's it's troublesome, it's burden, it messes your life up.
Now, if you're in the military or you're defending, I mean, there's things where, you, you know, you need overnight. But just to make money, it's, it's trouble. It's problem. Solomon had many wives. He had many children. And he ended up worshiping other gods. You married a wrong woman and you got a messed up family. Don't you go as a saved person, marry an unsaved person, and then wonder why your children are, are, are ruined. Don't you blame God. God told you in Corinthians, Paul wrote to you, you are only to marry a saved person. Your foundation was broken when you, of, of the Lord's house when you married somebody you weren't supposed to. Man will go to the lowest common denominator. You give children who are brought up in a house, you got a Bible in church and you got whiskey and cigarettes, I guarantee I know where they're going to turn to. And they're waiting for that magic age to come along when I'm given permission to choose church or anything else. I've seen it. I've lived it. If you want to raise your children for the Lord, you want to raise them right, and you don't want to be ashamed, you have to start with God. And you got to end with God. And you got to go with what the Bible says, joy. You want joy in raising your children? Jesus first. That's God. Others, that's your children. Next. And you last. When it comes to raising your children, we got it wrong in America. You are dead last. When it comes to your pleasures and what you want. And any woman who wants a career... She will not have any sexual relations because she may produce a child. Then you see where what happens in that, that relationship. Between a mother and child relationship. Children ought to be a priority, not a burden. And then you get those special little things. I know a family right now I'm thinking of. When those girls play their music for the Lord and they're walking by the room and hear it, I guarantee it's a joy. I've witnessed it myself with my children. I walk by the room and there's one on her knee praying to the Lord. One will be have his Bible out, he's reading and he's studying his Bible. My children will ask me at times, can I stay at the church to pass out tracts, go knock on doors, or not, not to have a bubble time, not to have a good time. I know I mean good times, not serving the Lord's not a good time, but I'm saying, you know, kind of stupid thing. When you see your children do things for the Lord and you don't have to the force them to do it, that's not being ashamed. I've witnessed that. That brings a choke up thing in your in your soul that you gotta turn to God. You gotta say, God, thank you. You can't say you've done it because the foundation is the Lord. Because as many times as as a dad that I've gone to the Lord and say, you know, I've sinned as a parent. And the Lord knows. And my sins are forgiven under the blood of the Lord. And the Lord shows me what to do. And I try to do it. And I'm not ashamed.
you go through the Bible and you read about parents and their kids and things that happen, you look at what the parents did. And then you wonder why the child reacted like that. Isaac said, hey, this is my sister. Well, that's what daddy said. And Isaac wasn't even around when, when that happened. Reuben sleeps with his father's wife. Well, dad, you slept with four women. Why shouldn't I do it? Solomon marries all these women. Well, D David, dad, you did it. See, to be a parent and not be ashamed of your children, you have to watch your own life. You're going to put your life in check with God. You can't expect the children to grow up reading the Bible when you don't. You can't expect your children to pray to God when you don't. You can't expect your children to be, to be happy in church when you drop them off at church and you drive off somewhere else. Or the bus comes and picks them up. Except the Lord build a house. A dad, a mommy, and children. They labor in vain that build it. Pick any house in any city that's not done by God, and it's going to end up probably, most likely, at the great white throne judgment. All the work they do, all the, the, the buy the things for the kids, buy the things for dad, buy the things for mom, it's all in vain. Except for the house that has the Lord as the foundation. The Lord is the foundation. If you do what the Lord tells you to do, you have great, great chances of having mama and daddy and children stand at the judgment seat of Christ. Earning rewards. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh, but in vain. You better have the Lord as your protection. And keep Satan out. You need to get and read the book The Holy War by John um, Bunyan. That book will show you how Satan breaks into your city. Through the eye gate, through the ear gate. It's a very interesting, great book to read along with Pilgrim's Progress. How to put your how to put your guard up. And you need to put your guard up because if you want to say, hey, I want to live for the Lord and do right, Satan will be at your doors. It is vain for you to rise up early and to sit up late. To eat the bread of sorrow. For so he giveth his beloved sleep. If you give your children a bedtime, you, you ought to have a bedtime too. Mom makes me go to bed at 8 30. Well, mom and dad seem to go to bed at the same time too every night. I guess it's just something that happens. Mine's earlier. Some parents go out to 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. It's wrong. Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord, something to pass on. And the fruit of the womb is his reward. It's not a burden. It's not something to get rid of. 
As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man. Soldier. So are children of the youth. So you're going to have children at a young age. You ought not be having children, you know, having a baby when, when you've got your great-grandchildren. Then again, if God gives it to you, happy is the man that has his quiver, that's what you carry arrows in, full of them. They shall not be ashamed. You may have one broken arrow, but there's always, there's always others there. You may have one flop, maybe two flop. Maybe three. For they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. I've had people, uh, since we've been doing the street ministry, people have cussed me out for the things that my daughter has done or does, holds a sign for Jesus, and pass out gospel. That, that is such a wicked thing to them. If they ever get saved, they'll realize that's the best thing. If they get to the great white throne judgment, Lord willing not. But if they get to the great white throne judgment, should have listened to that little girl. My eight-year-old girl told me what I needed to do and I rejected it. That's an enemy of God. They'll be speaking. That baby that David had by Bathsheba, God said, I gotta take its life because it's gonna cause people who are my enemies to speak against me. Children are not burdensome. They are a lot of work, a lot of labor. They, for you, are full of tears. And they, given to you by God, so you had liberty to produce the child. Now that you have the child, you got responsibility. And if you think you just can go see a doctor and have something done and to remove, you think that's going to eliminate your responsibility? The Bible says, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth that he shall also reap. I guarantee you're going to have sorrows even if you decide to abort the baby. I guarantee. I guarantee there's many a woman out there who chose that way and they wish they never had. I don't know how I can speak about adoption. God gave you that child. Oh, the man ran off. God gives you a design for sexual pleasure. God gives you a design on who to marry.
And this country is in violation of what God designed for marriage. The man is to be a man and the woman is to be a woman. And they're to be responsible. Five verses, there's so much in there. It takes prayer, it takes work, and it takes time. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. True love, if it's a wife to a husband, a husband to a wife, if it's a mother to a child, a father to a child, parents to a child, is a sacrifice. It's never a burden. Never. And the Bible says you are to look as, at a child as a reward from God. Well, what about this lost couple, this woman, this, you know, she had a drug me. It's only God that can get the two things together to make a baby in the womb. Are you saying God had nothing to do with that? Are you saying pregnancy is by chance? You know what it takes to make a fertilized egg? When you think about that, then you, you, you wouldn't be talking about abortion. You'd be, give God the glory. And if you realize every mother and every dad saved or lost, you will stand before God one day and you will give an account of that reward that God's given you. Whatever you did with it, you will give an account for all the arrows that God has given you. Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displays. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great. And when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home 
What joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, My God, how great Thou art! Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee, How great Thou art! How great!